All right, hello and welcome to Empowered Learning. This is the second video on decision analysis. And so like I said in the previous video, if you check that out, that um, we were going to talk about how we had all those probabilities change in our multi-stage decision tree. So we're gonna talk about that now and go into some of the uh, in-depth calculations of figuring that out. So in our um, uh, Thompson's lumber example, um, the owner could get more information about smart services, um, like information such as how many similar surveys had they done in the past, or um, what was the prediction of each survey. So of course, they probably make a prediction of where we think it's going to be this, and then when they actually did the survey, it turned out to be that. They could get that information from uh, from the smart services firm as well that conducted the survey, okay? And uh, they could also figure out stuff like, well, what was the actual result in each survey, of course, uh, did they actually predict the right or wrong thing? So again, uh, they could have got all that information along with the actual data from uh, the survey itself. And so having this information, uh, we could actually use uh, what we know about probabilities to be able to revise our, our probabilities in our decision-making process and hence the decision tree uh, that we came up with in video number one. So of course uh, we'll look at prior probabilities, we'll revise them and um, for Bayes theorem which actually goes over or tells us about what's called conditional probability. Um, if you're looking at the textbook for this um, it will be in Appendix A. Um, I am going to do, however, a, a short review for you to kind of get you up to speed on what it is that you need to look at. So when we look at um, fundamental probability concepts in general, so we say that the probability of an event or state of nature occurring is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one where zero is zero percent chance of happening and one is 100 percent chance of happening and so one of the things that we know of probabilities is that the sum of all the simple probabilities um, have to equal one so of course uh, probability of something happening plus a probability of something not happening um, however many ways you split that up it has to add up to be one or 100 percent okay So next, we have different types of uh, probability. So uh, one type is called objective probability. And so when we do this, uh, this is more of doing relative frequency or what we call the classical or logical approach. So uh, we're basically just watching something or, or, or experimenting on something and we see we take the number of times something actually happens to the number of times it, it, it has a chance to actually occur or the number of trials as it's put. So when we look here, we see that the probability of some event is going to be the number of occurrences of the event divided by the total number of trials or outcomes. So uh, to make a simple example out of this, uh, let's say we have a basketball player and they're shooting free throws. And if we say, um, they have a probability of 0.7 and basically what we're saying here is that they have a 7 out of 10 chance of making a free throw because they actually made a free throw seven times out of the total number of times 10 that they had a chance to shoot free throws okay and so the same kind of thing here um, probability of flipping um, heads on the coin of course coin has uh, two sides heads and tails so um, probability there is one half or 0.5. Okay. Similarly, for probability of getting a spade, um, if you are a card player, then you know that um, a deck of cards is has a num has 52 cards in it, and it's divided up into four suits. And uh, a spade is one of those suits. So you take 13 divided by, sorry, 52 divided by 13, and you get four. So here we see out of a, a deck of 52 cards, 13 of them should be a spade. 
out of the total number 52. Okay? So the other type of probability is subjective probability. And so this is based upon experience, kind of like how um, uh, Mr. Thompson in his lumber company, he sort of made a prediction on high demand, moderate demand, low demand. Okay? Uh, of course, you take opinions or polls, um, and that's kind of like uh, what we're doing here with the survey. And then, of course, um, you know, judgment of the individual. Okay? So it kind of goes along with experience as well. So we see uh, we have objective and subjective probability. And if you notice, we used a little bit of both in our previous example there. Now to uh, talk about statistically independent events. And so this is important because what we're trying to work toward is to talk about conditional probability. And what that means is we're trying to uh, get the likelihood of something happening depending upon something else happening first. And so in, when we study uh, probability in general, we have to first talk about what an independent event is versus a dependent event. And a dependent event is one where conditional probability comes into play. So an independent event, um, conditional probability really doesn't matter. So we need to be able to discern those two. So a statistically independent event um, is just a situation where one thing doesn't have anything to do with the other or it doesn't affect the outcome of the other. So in these examples, um, your education and your income level. So these um, normally are dependent events because, of course, based upon, um, as they say, the more you learn, the more you earn, right? So that would be dependent upon each other. You also, uh, example number two, if we had a deck of cards and we wanted to draw a jack of hearts out of that deck, and then we wanted to draw a jack of clubs out of that deck. Now, if we just did one trial there, and then let's say we pull the jack of hearts out, but we tried to, and then we put the card back and then we try it again, those are independent events because um, one does not have anything to do with the other, okay? A third example, so if the Chicago Cubs wins the National League uh, pennant and then the Chicago Cubs win the World Series. Of course, those are dependent events because the Chicago Cubs would not be able to go to the World Series unless they win their particular um, um, league division or pennant. Okay? And so then uh, we also see that this, it's snowing in Santiago, Chile, and then... Um, it's raining in Tel Aviv. And so, of course, those are independent events because the weather in one um, city in one part of the world has nothing to do with the other um, at the same time, of course. And so uh, we also want to talk about um, other types of probability, which are marginal probability and joint probability. Now, of course, marginal probability is just uh, the probability of an event occurring in general. And joint probability is the product of all those marginal probabilities. And so this is sort of the, the basis for um, what we're going to do when we study conditional probability um, here in just a second. So um, whenever we have two statistically independent events, we know that the probability of having A and B occur at the same time can be calculated just by doing the product of the individual um, probabilities. And so some of you may also see this written this way as well, where that upside down U basically means um, I want to know the probability of the intersection in between A and B. In other words, um, the event or trials that A and B have in common, okay? And so um, here, of course, it's the same thing as this. It's the joint probability of events A and B occurring together or one after the other. And of course, um, probability A and probability B are just marginal probabilities on their own. And so an example here is to say, let's say we want to... Uh, find the probability of tossing a, a six-sided die and on the first roll we get a two and then on the on the second roll um, we get a six okay so 
think I said it wrong. Let me read that again. So probability of tossing a, a six on the first roll and a two, yeah, and a two on the second roll of a six-sided die. So I, I did say it correctly. All right, so the probability of both um, happening at the same time, since these are independent events, is just the probability of the first one times the probability of the second, okay? Because when we roll the six the first time, um, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the die in any way to prevent it from rolling a two or making it roll a two the second time. So those two are independent events. And so we just multiply a probability together and we see that there's one out of 36 chance um, that we would roll a six the first time and then roll a two uh, the second time. Okay, So that's an example of what um, independent events are all about. Now, for conditional probability, um, again, we've already seen this notation before. And so how we read this is that we say this is the probability of some event B happening, uh, given that, that's what this line means, given that event A has already happened. Okay. And so down here, we just see that uh, we Look at this as probability of, of A happening, given that B has already happened, um, can be rewritten as the probability of A happening um, and, or if we put that in math terms, times the probability of event B happening, given that A has already happened. And of course, um, depending on what we're talking about, this could equal to probability of B happening, okay? So, uh, in moving on here, now we want to talk about uh, conditional probability in terms of Bayes' theorem or Bayes' law, okay? And so, we know that the occurrence of one event affects the occurrence of some other event. So, that's what we talk about um, when we have events that are dependent upon each other, okay? Now, of course, um, the marginal probability is unchanged, but the conditional and the joint probabilities are actually changed. And that's what uh, Bayes' theorem or Bayes' law talks about. And so, in short, it basically says that when we take the probability of some event happening, given that another event has happened first, that's going to be the quotient of the probability of both A and B being able to happen, um, divided by the probability of B just happening on its own. Okay. And so, of course, that may not make a whole lot of sense to you right now, but once we break this down some, um, I think it will. So, when we revise our probabilities uh, using uh, the Bayesian law or, or Bayesian analysis here, um, the whole process started off kind of like this. So, we had some uh, prior probabilities that, of course, the owner of JT Lumber had about high demand, moderate demand, and low demand. Okay. Now, the new information that we had, um, that resulted from uh, the survey that we paid for or and or scientific research if we wanted to um, pay for that information. Okay. Then after we use, take that stuff into account, we would come here and use uh, Bayesian's uh, or Bayesian analysis to be able to come up with revised probabilities that give us a better idea of what's going on. And then we use those in our decision tree model. Okay. And so if we look at the at the math now, we can show that um, what we had as a simple form of, of Bayes' law can now actually be written this way. Okay. And so all this says is the probability of A given that B has already happened. So the probability of event A happening, given that B has already happened, could be rewritten this way. And um, this A with the line over it means the complement of A. So that means um, the event A did not happen, okay? And so as this example here, if A was a fair uh, die, then the complement of A means we have an unfair or loaded die, okay? 
Now, um, as far as reading all this, I'm not going to, to get into all that because just reading it by itself, you're not going to really see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is on this next slide, I'm going to sort of break this down um, in this decision tree form so that you can see what this is actually trying to say. So here, if we were to interpret what we were talking about here, oops, yeah, made that skip, sorry. If we were going to interpret what we're talking about here, this is actually how it would be. And yeah, excuse me for this, but I'm trying to get this to show and it's not. So let me see if I can get this to show a little better. All right, so here we can translate what we're talking about here in the numerator and denominator in words. And so in words, it looks like this. So it's just the product of the probabilities along uh, the branch of this decision tree that you see down here um, through A ending at B. And that's divided by the sum of the probabilities along each branch in this decision tree um, ending at B. And so what I'm going to do is actually form that equation by following exactly what I said there. So of course, if I wanted to find the probability of A, given that B has already happened, then if I do the product of the probability along uh, branch A ending at B, then of course, this is A right here, okay? And so if I go and want to go to A ending at B, then I'm going to multiply the probability of A happening times the probability of B given that A happens. So if I multiply that, this is what I have. Okay. And so now, this, in the denominator, I do the sum of um, probabilities along each branch. Um, ending at B, okay? So, of course, I have B here and B there. So I have two branches. So one branch is, of course, the one that I went here to get what I had in the numerator. So I have to rewrite that again. And in addition to that, I have to go with this branch here, probability of A not happening along with um, multiplying that times the probability of B happening given that A did not happen. Okay, so probability of, oops, yeah, that's incorrect, so let me erase that. So probability of A not happening given that probability, uh, well, probability of A not happening times the probability of B given that A has not happened, okay? And so if you look back here on the previous slide, that's exactly what we have here, okay? Now, of course, the, the way it may be ordered is different, like um, these two things may be switched um, commutatively in the same deal here, but what this particular equation says and this particular equation says is indeed the same thing, okay? And so when we set up these decision trees, the reason why, another reason why we're setting them up is because we can figure out all of these conditional probabilities, okay? And by doing that, it makes trying to recalculate or revise our probabilities uh, based upon new information plus our own um, inferential guesses um, gives us a more accurate idea of, of what could happen. So now, um, just to kind of apply this, let's say that we went to Smart Services, okay? And we got all this past survey info from them. Now, of course, our owner here, he had this feeling uh, there would be a 30% chance for high demand, 50% uh, chance for moderate demand, and 20% chance for low demand. So. He's already had that feeling. For once they start asking questions about, well, all right, well, in your 
um, past surveys, you know, what happened? Did, did they come out to be positive? Did they come out to be negative? Did you guess right? Did you guess wrong? And so, um, of course, being a company that does survey information, they're going to have that type of information on them so you can ask them for it. And so everything that you see here is the information that they received from smart services. Okay. So to interpret this, um, this says when the actual outcome was we had high demand, um, we see that when we had a positive survey result, that was a 29 out of 30 times that actually happened. Okay. Where so in other words, uh, if we look here, the total number of surveys uh, that they had when the, the demand ended up being high demand was 30. Okay, So they had a total of 30 of those. And out of that, 29 times out of the 30, uh, the, result, uh, the, the survey results were positive. And only one time out of 30 were the survey results negative. And so, of course, in probability speak, um, this ends up being this number and that number, okay? And, of course, this number here is rounded because it's really 0 0.0333333 continuum, but we're just rounding it to three decimal places. Similarly, for uh, the moderate demand, we say that out of the past surveys they've done, they've done 15 surveys where uh, the actual outcome was moderate demand and we see that the survey results came out to be positive eight out of 15 times, and they came out to be negative seven out of 15 times. Of course, we have these corresponding numbers. And of course, same thing for the low demand. Um, we had 30 surveys that, um, well, we had uh, 30 times where the actual outcome was low demand. And when we ran surveys for that, uh, of course, we see that uh, the survey ended up being positive when they actually had low demand two times out of 30 and uh, negative 28 times out of 30. Okay. So all together, um, we've, this company has done 75 past or similar surveys on that particular industry. All right. So the next slide I have is actually um, a handwritten uh, page that I've done. And I did it this way so that you can see how we can actually take this information uh, that is in this chart that we have here at the bottom of this current slide, form that into a decision tree and see how these calculations are actually done. And you'll see that in doing that is actually quite easy to do once you have all the information and you set it up in the decision tree. So if we look here, this is what your decision tree would look like. And so we start off, um, and I'm just going to start off by saying that, of course, the first thing um, that we would do here is determine whether we're going to have high demand, moderate demand, low demand. And then after that, um, we would say, all right, well, did you have positive results or negative results based upon that? And the reason why I'm building this from left to right, starting off with high demand, moderate demand, and low demand and then um, looking at whether I have positive or negative survey results is because if you look at the information here, we started off with high demand, moderate demand, low demand. And then after that, we wanted to figure out for each one of those situations, how many times was it positive, how many times was it negative, okay? So that's why we're setting that up that way. So here we see that these numbers here are just the numbers that we got from the owner of JT Lumber. Okay, so those were our prior probabilities. And so now, of course, we see here that whenever we have um, um, high demand, either with high demand we had a positive survey or a negative survey. So when we read this, this is telling us the probability that we actually had a positive survey when, in fact, um, we know that before that we had high demand. So basically, uh, if, we, if we interpret that another way, um, a plant was built and 
it was found out that that plant experienced high demand. The survey that was taken on that particular market, uh, you know, after uh, before they did it, turned out to be positive 29 out of 30 times, okay? And it only turned out to be negative one out of 30 times. And so they did the same exact thing for um, moderate demand. So we know that the owner itself, himself was thinking that, all right, it's about 0.5 or 50% chance of it being moderate demand. Now, in, in the past markets, when they actually built a plant and it ended up, they did a survey on the market then as well, they found out that eight out of 15 times, um, they had moderate demand and in fact, they ended up having a uh, positive survey result. And so interpreting it directly here, we're saying that the probability of you having uh, positive survey results, given that you had already had moderate demand was eight out of 15 times. And of course, um, flip side of that is we had negative survey results. So here the probability of having a negative survey result, given that um, the market actually had moderate demand was seven out of 15 times. And so, of course, uh, we can follow suit for the, for the low demand as well and see how all those come together. So, main thing I want to do now is show you how we actually get these calculations here. So, if you remember, let's go back a few slides. We figure out the probability of A given that B has already happened first by doing the product of the probabilities along the branch of the first event ending at the second, and then uh, we divide that by the sum of all the probabilities along each branch ending at the second event. And the second event is, um, according to how this is um, written, is it's really the first event. So I could say this in another way. I could say this is the, um, the product of the probabilities along the branch through the uh, subsequent event happening ending at the branch where the first event happened. So we could think about it that way. So just main thing to remember here is, do you see how we went through and actually uh, said, all right, well, here is the branch of the decision tree that ended at B um, that kind of went along with what we were talking about here. So branch A through B, okay? And then here we actually did the sum of all of the branches that started with A and ended in B. That's essentially uh, what we did there. And so coming back to here, we're going to do the same exact thing. So if we want to figure out what is going to be the probability of um, having high demand, given that the survey result was positive. So if we want to figure out that information. Then what we do is start off with um, the branch that starts off with um, high demand, and we end with the branch that says positive survey results, okay? So here that would be this one branch right here. And so that's why we have 0.3 times 29 over 30, okay? Now, if we go and do what's in the denominator, the denominator says, do all the branches that start off with, um, with that start off with the demand and end up with positive survey results? Okay, so I'm going to switch colors here so that we can see uh, the difference there. So I'm going to go ahead and do this in green this time. All right, so. If I do this, then here we know that, of course, this is still a branch that starts off in demand and ends in positive survey result. So that's where uh, this amount times that comes from. And then we start here again and go through this branch. And so we see the 0.5 times the 8 over 15. So that's where this comes from. And then for our last branch, 
we go from here through here. And so that's how we have the 0.2 times 2 over 30. And once you see we actually do all those calculations, we end up getting the 0 0.509. Okay. And just to make sure that you see the connection here, this was the value that we had um, whenever we looked at that uh, multi, I guess, multi uh, stage decision tree. And this was the case of when we had high demand and we had positive survey results. So I'm going to go back to that slide now so that we, so we can see that. Okay, so I'm back at that slide now. And you see that this particular situation right here is exactly what I'm talking about. So here we have positive results and we have high demand. So we said the probability of having high demand given that we have positive survey results. Okay, So this is the probability of having high demand given that we had positive survey results. And if we're reading this from left to right, the first thing we had to do is to determine whether we should conduct a survey or not. And of course, we, of course we know from um, the previous video that we decided to um, conduct the survey. And if we had positive results, we should go with the high demand option. Because of course, that's the largest number that's involved here. And of course, if we had negative results, we should go with the small plant because that's the largest number out of all three of these. And I know you can't see this number down here on the bottom, but it is zero. Okay. So that's why we were interested in, in finding out what is going to be the um, probability of having um, high demand given that we have positive survey results. Okay. And of course, you see again that that's the revised probability that's there for that. All right, so we're, we're back now to this original slide here. And I wanted to choose uh, another probability just to give you another example of, of how this would work. So here I pick, let's find the probability of um, having low demand given that we had a negative survey result. Okay. And so here we do it the exact same way. So I'm going to come down here and erase these options here and kind of go through the process again so you can see how it all works. And this time I'll start off uh, operating switch colors again because I know that green is kind of hard to look at. All right, so I'm going to put this in red this time. All right, so here, um, if we're doing the probability of um, having low demand given that we have a negative survey result, then of course, we want to start with demand and end in the branch that has uh, negative survey results. So of course, this is just our um, demand branch or demand node here. And so here we have a low demand and we want to go to it having negative survey results. So we're going all the way through here. And so we would multiply 0 0.2 times 28 over 30. Okay. All right. So now if we want to calculate the uh, denominator denominator is telling us that we need to look at everything from um, demand node going all the way to any end of the branch that has negative survey result so of course we have negative survey result here negative survey result there negative survey result there so to get there of course the first branch would be the same as this one Second branch would be this one, and third branch would be this one. And if you notice here, we still have uh, the 
0.2 times 28 over 30 down here and right here, 0.5 times 7 over 15, and the 0.3 times 1 over 30 here. And so, of course, we add all that up um, in the denominator after multiplying, and we see that we uh, get this answer of 0.43395348A4, which simplifies um, to, well, not simplify, but rounds to uh, 0.434 if we're round. And of course, this particular probability, I'll go back to the slide and show you where that is as well. So down here, we see that this is the probability that we calculated for our um, part of the decision tree where we actually conducted the survey and we wanted to see what our results were. Okay. So now you can see why in this next slide here, how we actually come up with all of these values. And so of course, if you have your decision tree in front of you, it makes it real easy to, to come up with. And of course, um, here I've just sort of highlighted everything. So um, if you notice the sum of all the probabilities of um, the high, moderate, and low demand for each case in, still ends up being one, no matter what. So the sum of all these three end up being one, some of these three end up being one, some of these three end up being one, some of these three here end up being one, some of these three end up being one, and some of these three end up being one. Okay. And of course, I just have uh, the, the two probabilities that I found for you using uh, Bayes' law. I have those circled there. All right, and so now if we were to try to compute this in table form, this is kind of what it would look like. And so you can see what we're trying to recreate is the same exact thing that we did in the uh, decision tree model. But again, it, it looks more uh, table form, but now you see how they're getting all their particular values there. And we also see that in all the cases, that the revised probabilities um, still have to end up equaling one here, okay? So again, this is all information that we've seen. We've just seen it in a different way. We've seen it in the decision tree model. And of course, same deal here for the negative survey results. Um, the same information that is in the decision tree is just put in table form. All right, so now the, the last thing that we need, to, we need to talk about is utility theory. And so utility theory, uh, we use this as, as a, a way to be able to model risk mathematically by being very objective about it, okay? And logical about it, I should say. And it is an alternative to calculating expected monetary values and uh, the good thing about this is that it actually incorporates uh, the person's attitude towards risk. So in other words, um, you're getting more of a qualitative, um, uh, you're getting qualitative data mixed into your objective or quantitative data as well. And uh, you're putting numbers around it or you're quantifying um, uh, the person's risk uh, comfortability level uh, to, to for lack of a better way of putting it, um, to try to add that into your model as well. So, of course, if you know someone is very risk averse, meaning that they don't like risk, then, of course, you know that the, their penchant for being able to deal with it is low, and thus the probability of them wanting to, to, to take risk is low, and you want to uh, model that. Versus if you had the same situation, you had someone else that um, who... Uh, was very welcome to risk, then of course the probability of them wanting to take a certain deal would be higher. And so um, in the decision-making process, of course, a lot of times our gut feeling of things or, or our approach to life as far as how we deal with risk is very important. 
um, in that decision making process. And so utility theory actually utilizes that. Now, um, a utility function um, converts a person's attitude towards money and risk into numbers in between zero and one. So basically trying to convert it into some form of a probability. And uh, using a utility function also normalizes a decision maker's attitude um, of value of money. So it turns something that is a subjective or, or qualitative type feature into something that's objective. And so therefore, uh, once the emotions are put out of it, once you've already expressed your emotions one time, you don't have to express them again. And you kind of let the objectivity do its work. So that's what utility theory is all about. So let's uh, look at this situation here. So the background that we have on this uh, lottery ticket example is, let's say we have um, a person named uh, Jane, and she's bought a lottery ticket. Um, the winner of this particular um, lottery ticket out of all the ones that's been bought um, will be chosen by just flipping a coin. And so we're just saying flipping the coin because that would make it make the model here a bit easier to deal with. Okay. Of course, we know in, in real life, a lot of tickets, they kind of, you know, have all the tickets in one place and they're flipping them around or whatnot, or they have little balls in, them in that little uh, circular machine or whatever. Uh, I'm not a gambler, if you can tell, so. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so doing a flipping coin thing makes the model easier. So uh, if the coin is flipped and it lands on heads, she gets paid nothing. Okay. And if she, um, however, if it lands on tails, she's going to get paid $100,000. So that is what you see right here and right here. Okay. So 50-50 uh, chance whenever you're flipping the coin, um, she gets paid nothing, get paid $100,000, okay? So that's kind of uh, what's, what's happening here, okay? Now, um, let's say someone else um, walks into the same room. Um, they don't have a lottery ticket, but they want to get in on the action, okay? And so let's say this person offers her uh, $35,000 guaranteed um, just to buy her one ticket. The thing is, is uh, should she take that or not? And of course, based upon your uh, level of being able to handle risk, that may be a yes, that may be a no. Okay. And so she accepts um, that $35,000 guaranteed offer. Um, she will lose out on $65,000 if her lottery ticket is actually a winning one, okay? But however, of course, if she loses, um, in other words, she's not a winner of the lottery ticket, then she just missed out on getting uh, $35,000 back. And of course, um, that would be great if she only paid a few dollars for the lottery ticket in the first place, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> if we look at this, we see this whole situation modeled in a decision network, okay? And so we're, we're starting off here when we analyze this from the right and going to the left. So we know we have a 35K offer um, available to us. We also know that uh, if we get heads, nothing happens, tails, uh, we get uh, $100,000. Okay, so these are the expected payoffs. Okay. And so our expected monetary value here, um, based upon uh, what our payoffs are, uh, for if we reject the offer, is going to be this $50,000 that's here. Okay. So that's the expected payoff. The expected payoff, if we accept the offer, is 35. So if we look at this in terms of um, just expected monetary value, then of course we should just say, oh, forget that man. Uh, I'm gonna stay in here and see if I'm act I actually have the winning lottery ticket. But again, in doing that for, that, for the person who paid for the ticket, which is Jane in this case, that may not sit well with her if she's a real uh, risk averse person, okay? She may need to go with the 35 
a thousand dollar offer but how will you know what's best for her and that's the whole point of learning about utility theory um, we we have an alternative to doing expected monetary value because expected monetary value has a lot of um, objective things in it and there's no way to measure how Jane feels about the deal in the first place and so that's why we're going to um, study this particular uh, way of being able to figure out what we should do all right so let's look at what's called Jane's utility function okay so Jane wants to, to form a utility function for herself in order to get an idea of the measure of risk um, she's willing to take. And so by doing that, what she's trying to do is get her emotions out all at once. And if this was an ideal situation, she would probably do this before she goes into that room to um, see if she has a winning lottery ticket or not. And so when she goes in there, she can kind of know based upon this utility function she's going to form. Should I or should I not take an offer from someone um, that's willing to buy my ticket when I go in the room? And if they do, um, how much should I actually uh, want for my ticket? Okay. So when we look at this, we see that the, the, cert the certainty equivalent is the value in which Jane will walk away from the game and accept a counteroffer. And uh, this value is looked at as the value where, in Jane's mind at least, the payoff plus the risk factor equals out 50-50, okay? And so that's why you see that uh, question mark there about what is gonna be the certainty equivalent, certainty equivalent factor, okay? And so we need to figure that out. So when we form a utility function, um, we know that the worst payoff utility is going to be zero. The best payoff utility is going to be one. Okay, And so the certainty equivalent is going to be the minimum guaranteed amount you are willing to accept to avoid the risk, of, uh, the risk associated with the gamble. And so uh, what we're going to do is take what... Um, the, the expected monetary value that you can expect to get out of that. And we're going to chop that up. And we're going to chop it up into saying, okay, well, uh, we know that you have a range on average to expect anywhere from zero to $50,000 according to expected monetary value. But what if we say, all right, well, let's chop that up and say, all right, well, how about from zero to 15 to 20,000? Um, would you take the deal then? And then, all right, from there, well, how about from, you know, let's say, uh, um, what is it, 40,000, 50,000? How would you take the deal then? And so you want to get certain points to say, all right, well, if I gave you this much at this point, would you take my deal or would you pass? And so by us being able to quantify that um, objectively and quantitatively, we'll be able to come up with a utility function to measure uh, Jane's risk. All right, so how we're going to do this? We start off by, of course, defining what our beginning and end utility point values will be. And so we say that um, the utility function at zero is zero, utility function at 50,000 is one, okay? And so we're, we're trying to basically make a graph here where we're going to have um, it's the amount of money here based upon uh, probability that I will walk away from the deal on the on the current y axis here. OK, so here we say in between uh, zero dollars and fifty thousand um, dollars. Jane said she'll walk away if someone says, all right. Um, if I give you $15,000, will you roll? Uh, or will you uh, give me your ticket? And of course, if she says 15,000 is enough for me, that is her certainty equivalency level for that range, okay? And so what that, what that tells us is that um, if we do a utility function where 15,000 is that walk away amount, then what we're going to do is sort of a 50-50 split. Because remember, we said that what we're trying to measure here is what would be the 
the the walk away amount that she would have to have to feel like, all right, well, um, I feel like I feel good as far as having a 50 50 chance of winning something. OK, so here we would say uh, the utility function at zero. Of course, that value is going to be zero times 0 0.5. And that's your probability of losing. Probability of winning is also 0 0.5. Um, of course, you're looking at this as 50 50. And you're saying that um, your utility function um, at 50,000 is one, of course, because we predefined these. And so when we do all this, we see that uh, the resulting value is just going to be 0.5. So on this graph to kind of make this make sense here, uh, what we're saying here is that when we say at $15,000 here, we're saying that, hey, my, my utility function value or the measure of risk I have here is 50-50. So I'm okay with walking out um, with $15,000, even though I have up to a potential $100,000 with an expected monetary value of $15,000, of, of $50,000. Um, but yet I still feel like I got a fair shake. Okay. And so now we define that at, at the 15 K level, that's about 50%. All right, 50, 50 chance. I'm okay. So now we come here to um, the second trial. So now we say, all right, well, we want to change the range from zero to 50,000. We already know that your walk away amount is 15K. Now let's say from 15K to 50K, what is your walk away amount? And then there, Jane says, all right, well, I think I can walk away. If I knew I can get at least 15, but up to 50,000, I would walk away um, at 27,000. Okay, so at that point, we know that 27,000 is our next point. And now what we do is we use uh, the low end and the high end again, just like how we did for the first trial. So the low end for the first trial was uh, utility function evaluated at zero, utility function evaluated at 50,000. That was for the low and high. Now what we're going to do since we're in between 15 and 50k, we're going to use utility function at 15,000 as the low, utility function at 50,000 for the high. And of course, um, we know that the utility function at 15,000, that value is equal to 0.5, so that's why you see 0.5 right here. Of course, 0.5 is 50% um, walk away, 50% um, walk away there or 50% um, lose 50% 50, 50 win you can think about it that way as well and when we come here we see that this ends up being our uh, 0.75 because 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25 and then 1 times 0.5 is just 0.5 add that up we get 0.75 so we see on, on the higher end um, what's basically going to be the highest amount she's willing to walk away from before actually going all in and wanting at least the expected value of $50,000, okay? And so then on the third trial, uh, we want to see on the lower end. So if you knew that you would either get nothing or get at most $15,000, what is your walk away amount? And of course, for this one, um, Jane asked herself that $6,000 would be enough and so that's her certainty equivalence for that range and so now we do the same thing over again of course we use um, utility function evaluated zero for the low we use utility function um, at 15,000 for the high and we just use all these previous values that we got before in here and so we see for zero of course that's just zero for 15,000, that's just 0.5. And of course, that's how we get 0.25. So at the lower end of the spectrum, um, we know that 6K is going to be a walk away amount. And so now we have all these points 
that are on our utility curve that we're trying to draw here. And so this is what our utility curve would look like if we were to draw. And if you notice, um, it sort of bends concave down like this, okay? And so that's going to indicate to us when I go to the next slide that Jane is more of a, a risk averse person, meaning that she wants to avoid risk more so than she wants to um, be involved in risk, okay? All right, so um, now we're gonna talk about the risk premium here for just a second. So um, the expected monetary value a person is willing to give up to avoid the risk associated with the gamble is called the risk premium. And so the risk premium is just, of course, the expected monetary value of whatever the gamble is minus the certainty equivalence, equivalent. And so uh, for our example here, we know that the expected monetary value was 50,000. Um, the certainty equivalent was different depending upon um, what range we were in. Okay, so at first we had what was it, 15,000, and then we had 27,000, and we also had 6,000. And this was at the 25% level, this was at the 50% level, this was at the 75% level. Okay, and so. Um, normally what we see here is that risk avoiders um, or the risk averse, uh, the risk premium is always greater than zero. Okay? Um, the risk indifferent is kind of neutral, just um, averages out and weighs out. And then the risk seeker also always has a risk premium that is less than zero. So it ends up being negative. And so we see for uh, James, risk premium for the first trial, of course, it was more than zero. Second trial, more than zero. Third trial, more than zero. So this is why we say Jane is a risk avoider or a risk averse type of person. And so we see here that for risk avoiders, uh, the graph here tends to look uh, what we call concave down whereas for the risk seeker it is concave up and so how we tell the difference in between concave up and concave down is simple so for concave down functions if we had some water and we poured it water on the function it would roll off that is what concave down is if we had concave up function then if we had that same water there and poured it down it would actually uh, hold and settle on the bottom so that's um, one practical way to talk about um, concave up versus concave down. And so here, um, if we use the utility function as a criteria, then of course um, the utility values will actually replace uh, the monetary values in, in the decision tree. Okay. So if we was looking at our uh, situation before, um, about the, the JT lumber situation. This is an example of what this may have looked like if we were going to um, actually use expected monetary values in the mix. But now you're going to see um, once we actually employ our utility function value here based upon uh, what we saw in the previous slide that now where we had monetary values we now have our utility values. And we can actually use that to be able to help us make our decision. So this is how um, utility theory is actually used to, um, to help us make decisions as an alternative to looking at expected monetary value. And this does also complete uh, the presentation here. So I know this presentation was, was long. I had to do it in two parts. But as you see, it's a lot of information in there. And hopefully this will help you out in your data-driven decision-making classes. Take care.